I will begin this lecture by summarizing my book, When Ivory Towers Were Black, which describes Columbia University's brief effort to achieve racial justice over 50 years ago during the civil rights movement. I hope that you have read or that you will read the book in its entirety, but for now, I feel a particular urgency, given all that's going on, to use it only as a point of departure for discussing today's racial justice movement and the lessons that history holds for it. Thus, my lecture will primarily be forward-looking at how you can work to dismantle white privilege in architecture education. An essential aspect of the Columbia story is that in the wake of the 1968 student rebellion there, faculty at the School of Architecture adopted a governance structure that gave everyone a say in running the school. Featured in this new illegal structure were student-led councils that immediately organized first to revise the school's treasured Eurocentric curriculum, second, to improve the university's relationship with Harlem through a number of outrageous community engagement proposals, and finally, to change the school's mostly all white demographics. Reasoning that professionals were needed to address the inner city crisis, they set out to recruit black and Puerto Rican students, staff, and faculty who would understand the problem firsthand. The 1960s movement to achieve racial justice occurred at several other universities, including, as I vaguely recall, Harvard, Yale, Michigan, Berkeley, and surely many others that I do not recall. However, Columbia's recruitment effort was one of the most successful university-wide and probably the most successful nationwide in architecture and planning. It relied upon grassroots initiative, but it also included administrators' active engagement in conducting interviews, helping with applications, and convincing people to apply. And none of this would have happened without a $10 million grant from the Ford Foundation that not only supported the recruits, but that also supported the community outreach projects that positioned them as leaders among their peers. Another key point that relates, relates to the qualifications the recruits brought to the School of Architecture. So let me summarize them. Many had been introduced to architecture early in life. Some were enrolled in professional programs in architecture or related fields. Others already held professional or undergraduate degrees. Others had teaching experience, including at Columbia. Still others had worked in offices and agencies, and most had developed leadership skills as civil rights activists, or as was true in my case, as professionals in their own right. Once accepted into the program, the recruits equaled or outperformed their white counterparts. 49 of at least 59, and I say at least because I know I didn't find everyone. In fact, as I'm walking around the streets of New York, I encounter people who say, you know, you forgot to include so-and-so. So 49 of at least 59 ethnic minority students 
graduated, with quite a few being the first in their family to earn a college degree. This group received a total of 51 degrees from Columbia, including 17 master's degrees and three doctoral degrees. After graduation, at least eight earned 11 advanced degrees. At least 21 are licensed architects, with five being fellows in the American Institute of Architects out of about 100 black fellows nationally. At least one, two have foreign certification. At least two are licensed planners. At least one is a licensed interior designer. At least two are, are distinguished fine artists and at least one is a college president. Unfortunately, Columbia's experiment in racial equity was short-lived, as was the nation's. So you will understand what drove both its success and its unraveling, which is very important to understand as you're planning your own activities today. I want to read aloud a passage from my book to reinforce the notion of the fragility of transformation before moving forward to discuss today's anti-racial racist organizing. In this passage, I use the term guide to describe the recruits because the way I'm writing the recruits are guiding the reader through this incredible experience. During your brief sojourn at the apex of the School of Architecture's arc of insurgency, your ethnic minority guides had truly amazing experiences. Across the country, virulent Black student activism pushed colleges to expand affirmative action and the financial aid it required, which led to a sharp jump in Black college enrollment in the 1970s. Columbia University reflected this national trend, but the School of Architecture sprinted ahead to take an unparalleled lead in educational equity. In 1970, the school had an astounding 14% ethnic minority enrollment, up from 2% in 1968. And then those numbers soared even higher in 1971 to 16%, a level probably not equaled in any other architecture school in a predominantly white university. As phenomenal as they may seem, the numbers were only one aspect of your guide's amazing experiences. Even more powerful was their sense of being part of an ethnic minority community that was advancing change in the city and university. Your guide's presence in the ivory tower was buttressed by that community's collective triumphs. It was buttressed when Arch took a stand for self-determination by creating alternatives for the proposed state office building that responded to community needs and values. It was buttressed by Arch's Ford-funded pipeline project with its tutoring and internships in the city's best design firms and its scholarships in the nation's best architecture schools. It was buttressed when AIA declared that through such pipelines, architecture would become a major professional opportunity for Blacks. It was buttressed when the university promoted your guide's beloved mentor, 
Max Bond to a professor position. It was buttressed when the respected Romaldo Jurgula unreservedly declared that, and I quote, perhaps the single most positive fact of these past years has been the effort made by the school to offer professional education to minority students. Through the adoption of a broader spectrum of evaluations and admissions and initiation of new programs, new energy and ideas have come to the school, thus assuring it of continued vitality. We have probably the best students and instructors from minorities of any school of architecture, and their work and dedication is exemplary." End of quote. Your ethnic minority guides had amazing experiences at the apex of the School of Architecture's arc of insurgency because they were part of a community that had propelled itself forward by leaps and bounds. But they had little chance to revel in their achievements as the arc began its downward descent almost immediately. The underpinnings of the descent began in the larger society and then seeped into the university and school. In the wink of an eye, widespread ambivalence toward upending racism and economic inequality took over and propelled the arc of insurgency downward. You see, just as multiple dynamics help create the collective will to correct historical inequities, multiple dynamics help smother it. The Vietnam War, urban unrest, white backlash, forced busing, escalating energy costs, and a newly affluent middle class unwilling to support social programs. In the wink of an eye, the 1960s thrust toward equal rights shifted and the arc of insurgency tumbled downward. The question that looms large in my mind is how to prevent this kind of unraveling or flip in the current political lingo from happening. Today, the nation is experiencing even deeper crises than those that were occurring in the 1960s. They include the COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected the entire world in unprecedented ways, as has the climate crisis and the ever increasing concentration of wealth and power, which has made the United States the leader in income inequality among developed nations, to leave unmentioned the current political divisiveness. However, the crisis that has upended the architecture profession is the racial crisis. The videotaped, cold-blooded murder of George Floyd on 25 May somehow made visible the nation's long legacy of the state-sanctioned massacre of unarmed black children and adults. And somehow, that was one person too many. As the streets filled with protest, the news filled with reports documenting the effect of racism upon all areas of American life, especially inequities in housing and green space that made black and brown communities disproportionately vulnerable 
to COVID-19 and climate change. The architecture profession took notice and as has occurred historically, young people took the lead. On the 1st of June, an anti-racism website appeared with letters from 14 organizations demanding design justice. Three were from design advocacy organizations and 11 were from schools of architecture and planning written mostly by students and recent alumni and inviting signatures from the public. Notably, Carnegie Mellon was not among those schools. Subsequently, the site was updated to, and I quote here, uplift black design communities, serve as a resource for communities in need of pro bono design services and serve as a resource to non-black and white people to deepen their anti-racism work within the design disciplines, end of quote. The updated site had 10 additional demand letters, including one written to the board of directors of the American Planning Association three projects, including one organized by designers protests that I will come back to, numerous events at universities and professional organizations, and fundraising efforts, including one for a landscape architecture fellowship at Cal Poly Pomona. The site has disappeared since I reviewed it in October. I'm trying to find out what happened to it and can I get a copy of what was deleted. Of the activity going on in architecture, one of the most potentially transformative is the Design as Protest Collective, a coalition of designers led by Brian C. Lee Jr., the New, York, New Orleans architect trained activist who may have lit the fire that is currently burning in the architecture profession. The Design as Protest Collective, or DAP, champions a radical vision of reparations through the processes and outcomes of design. Among its demands are defunding the police, an end to SEPTED, or crime prevention through environmental design, an end to the nation's high rate of incarceration, which is the world's largest and is disproportionately young, male, Latino, and especially black, and the creation of affordable community-controlled neighborhoods. DAP volunteers are organizing a number of campaigns, including one to erect 100 memorials over the 2021 Juneteenth weekend to commemorate people and places affected by white supremacy. Another to support students in their movement to decolonize design education, and another, my favorite, to organize high school students, high school youth programs to join the action. A second effort that started long before the Floyd protest is Black Space which honors the lives of countless black victims of violence, celebrates the joys of black existence, and mourns the loss of so many promising black futures. The coalition of young professionals who make up black space challenges architects, planners, urban designers, architects, and all curators of built spaces to unlearn 
traditional values and rethink practice according to 14 principles laid out in a manifesto on the processes of design and community building. A key leader in implementing the manifesto is Peter Robinson, an alumnus of Columbia University who uses his architecture and planning studios at Cornell University as a black space laboratory. For example, in, in October, I participated in a mid-review, mid and this is not a picture of the mid-review, this is a pre-COVID picture. I didn't think to take a picture of the online session that I was part of, but I participated in this mid-review of a collaboration between Robinson's Cornell students and the teenagers at Medgar Evers College Preparatory School to explore and enhance the experiences of young black men in their neighborhoods. One team imagined reclaiming basement spaces throughout the city for quiet and active recreation. And other teams presented equally compelling ideas for improving young black men's urban experiences. At the end of the review, both the university students and the teenagers declared that their collaboration had changed their view of what is architecture and planning. Recently, black, black space expanded out from New York to Chicago and Oklahoma, where other young professionals are working to design spaces where black people and their culture matter. Though Brian Lee's um, design as protest includes Dark Matter University or DMU as one of its projects, I would call it out as an independent transformative effort in architecture. And the fact that um, one organization or one effort is uh, claiming another isn't really a problem. It's a strategy that, that these uh, young people are using to kind of multiply their efforts and to be every place. So it's they're different efforts, but they claim each other. I think it's quite interesting. Spearheaded by Justin Garrett Moore, Executive Director of City Design and an adjunct associate professor at Columbia, DMU takes the position that existing systems have been unable to change their centering of whiteness which has caused widespread suffering both in the professional community and in the society at large. DMU posits that collective liberation cannot occur only within individual institutions, but that it must take place both within and outside those institutions. Its faculty include people like me, who hold academic positions, as well as those who do not. Its agenda includes creating new forms of knowledge that are grounded in lived experience, creating networked institutions that lift marginalized voices, and creating collective, collaborative design practices that serve a broad swath of society, the latter very much reflecting the black space studio that I just told you about. In October, I moderated a webinar that was co-sponsored by the New York Review of Architecture and the Architectural League of New York, a group that has historically been at the forefront of activism in the profession. 
The event addressed anti-racist transformation of design education and called upon institutions, particularly public ones, to repair their wrongdoings and commit to a more equitable future. Under the leadership of a University of Virginia student, Mion Niguyen, that event has morphed into a survey that will measure progress, compare strategies across institutions, and develop an index for student organizing and progress. The November publication of the survey also announced the search for a new dean at Mion's University, UVA, framing it as an opportunity to explore what it means to be a dean, which I think is pretty gutsy, or maybe froggy in Ivor's language. In reviewing the CMU website to figure out where this presentation fits within the institution's larger diversity and inclusion in agenda, I came across the Race and Inclusion Initiative of Pedagogies 2020, which has both an internal focus upon the curriculum and school culture and an external focus upon Pittsburgh and the larger society. In my opinion, which may be quite misinformed, but I'll give it anyway, the initiative will need to reach out to the varied decolonizing efforts that are occurring in the national design community. As DMU posits, change cannot occur within individual institutions, but requires networking across and outside those institutions. In an essay entitled, Finding My Voice in the Dominant Key, which was published in Jack Travis's 1991 book, African American Architects, it was the first book published about African American architects. And I wrote a little essay in it, stating the DMU position, though somewhat differently. Here's what I wrote three decades ago, and this is a quote. Even though as an academic, I am immersed in the dominant voice's view of power, authority, success, fairness, justice, human ability, and so forth, I feel an urgency to establish an alternative worldview, to question dominant values, although they are, if not perfectly, sustaining me, and to seek an alternative praxis of architecture." End of quote. With that, I urged my sisters and brothers to focus upon getting into the box while simultaneously trying to change it. I urged that they work with one hand to achieve power, and authority within the traditions of the dominant culture and with the other hand work to achieve the meaning and social purpose that is so lacking in mainstream practice. My 1991 call is not unlike those issued by Dark Matter University, Black Space, Design as Protest, and other efforts that are bubbling up as the architecture profession seeks to decenter whiteness. As this work proceeds, Columbia's arc of insurgency offers several hopeful lessons. First, a revolution is at hand and young people will lead it. Historically, social movements around the world have been led by people who are 30 years old and under, including the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, 
the liberation movement in Cuba and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. That means that this group, you, has to be ready because a window of opportunity is at hand. The anger that drove the 1968 Columbia insurgency came from insidious injustices, layered one on top of the other until anger exploded in a courageous defiance of the status quo. Today, anger has once again built due to even more insidious injustices. At any moment, the nation's anger could explode and young people must be ready to undertake a courageous defiance of the status quo. So have a plan of action ready to go. Second, white people have to be willing to give up the invisible, unearned, and unrecognized benefits they accrue from normative architecture practice, including its very definition, the problems it addresses, the way it is financed, and the kind of work that gets recognized, all of which require connections to wealth and power. Columbia's experiment was successful because the recruits did not have to adapt to the norms of an institution that had been designed around white privilege. Rather, those student-led councils made a fundamental structural change in institutional practice, including what was being learned and for what purpose. This change was essential to the success of the recruits. Ensuring opportunities for marginalized populations within architecture requires a commitment to recognize and change those norms that ensure white privilege. When DAP sets out to involve teenagers as equals in its movement to obtain reparations through the processes and outcomes of design. When black space involves university students in an ethnographic exploration of black teenage males' urban experience, they are deconstructing normative architecture practice. Lesson number three examine all the possibilities for new practice directions, which the recruits were forced to do. 26 of the 49 graduated after the 1973 fiscal crisis hit full force. So they had to invent identities within an overwhelmingly white profession as the progress in race relations vanished into thin air. Yet, over many years, they were able to shape distinctive careers that in turn informed new directions in architecture practice. Many undertook projects that had broad public benefit with outcomes that were greater than a single building or specific landscape. Some acquired civic leadership skills that expanded their influence beyond conventional professional roles and services. Others figured out how to break their dependence upon paying well-heeled clients by undertaking fundraising, project planning and development, research and advocacy. Still others became experts in the relationship and coalition building that is needed to help public interest projects come to fruition. This is what all the groups I have described are setting out to do in advancing new forms of collective collaborative practice.
In the Fire Next Time. James Baldwin asserted that black people are essential to disrupting white people's investment in maintaining their privilege. Columbia's experiment demonstrated Baldwin's assertion. And I would note that it took a substantial cohort of black and brown students, faculty, and staff to disrupt the status quo. The experiment demonstrated that transformation requires a fundamental breaking point, requires a disruption in the exclusionary norms of white privilege, requires new directions in architecture practice that address the needs of the many disenfranchised peoples around the world. The experiment demonstrated all this Lesson number four is just how much collective power is needed to maintain structural change and prevent the pendulum from swinging ever backward. This is why I think DMU's agenda of working across and outside of institutions is so powerful. It promises the collective power to maintain change. I believe that structural change will require architects, just to summarize, to assume responsibility for serving the most disenfranchised populations, to fashion an experiment in democracy that is ablaze with the spirit of insurgency, to become civic leaders who facilitate projects with broad public benefit, to refashion normative practice so that it can embrace the life experiences of black and brown talent, and to recognize that an expanded talent pool is essential in the 21st century, and not just expanded in terms of demographic makeup, but expanded in the terms of considering what is talent. I spent a lot longer unraveling the story in my Ivory Towers book project than I ever imagined and even more time figuring out how to tell the story so anyone would want to read it. Yet the real challenge has been in framing the lessons learned so as to inspire bold action in today's terrain of unyielding racism and equally unyielding resistance to change. And as I have made clear, I believe that the group I am addressing, you, is the one that can spearhead enduring structural change. I hope that I have been able to put enough ideas on the table to generate your input into this important topic. Thank you very much for listening and now for the discussion.